Well, thank you very much. I, I feel so welcomed, and uh, I'm just so grateful. Um, as my granddaughter Elise said to me, uh, Pop, you're going to be a pastor today. <laughs> so sit down so I can comb your hair. <laughs> and she has just done a tremendous job. So thank you, Elise. Thank you. You know, I first want to say a word of gratitude and thankfulness for Bishop Peggy Johnson for her leadership here in Eastern Pennsylvania, for her warm hospitality of welcoming me, uh, working with me in this time of transition, to uh, sharing not only information, but just uh, how much uh, she was glad that I was here, but also um, just providing everything I needed to help this transition to go well. I'm also grateful for the cabinet that she has appointed. This is a great cabinet and a great staff here in Eastern Pennsylvania. And I so look forward to working with them and all of you as uh, we continue to help the mission and ministry of Christ go forward. I also want to say thank you to Beverly, who has uh, faithfully been with me. Uh, Beverly and I met in high school. And uh, so we've been married 43 years, but we uh, dated and were engaged for five years prior to that. So uh, 48 years, so it seems to be working. And uh, just so grateful for her support. And also, again, I just want to say thank you to my family. I know they're uh, watching in Washington, D.C., and also in California, uh, but also Mark and Meredith being here. Mark is an elder in the church as well and serving as a pastor in New Jersey. He's actually an elder from the Northern Illinois Conference and on loan. And uh, he came to a greater New Jersey because his wife, Meredith, who is a deacon in the church, got a position with Drew Theological School. And Meredith uh, heads both the um, PhD and DMIN programs. And so if any of you are looking for an advanced degree, you should speak to Meredith because they have a great program at Drew. Well, I remember standing uh, just about on this uh, very spot and um, people were coming in. Uh, the groom and the groomsmen were coming over this way. The bridesmaids were coming down the aisle the bride uh, finally came down the aisle. It was moving and touching, deeply uh, moved by the moment and the spirit. And when the bride came and they joined hands, she looked lovingly into his eyes and said, well, we're here. We might as well go through with it. <laughs> Well, we're here, we might as well go through with it. You know, it was at the altar at the St. James Church during a lay witness mission that I worked my way from the balcony because uh, when you had four kids, you sat as far from the action as possible and made my way uh, down the balcony steps and down the aisle and there I knelt and offered my life to Jesus Christ. At a particular moment, I felt this hand on my shoulder. It felt like the hand of God. And I looked up and it was my mom who was there to pray with me. And it was the hand of God. You know, it's been at altars all throughout Eastern Pennsylvania where my life has been shaped. It would be at that same altar at St. James Church where I would be confirmed. It would be at that same altar that Beverly and I would get married. It would also be the, at that same altar when I would pray about what God's calling was for my life. Later, it would be at the altars of Lebanon Valley and Albright Colleges 
where I would be ordained a deacon and then an elder. And it was here at this church and through not only this congregation, but the people of Eastern Pennsylvania that I was lifted up to be a bishop. And so all I can say is, it's good to be home. It's good to be home. I've got a lot of homes. I've got a great home in greater New Jersey. I've got a lot of homes in other places. But this is the place that birthed and nurtured me into ministry. And I will never forget all that Eastern Pennsylvania has done for me. Now, one of the things that I've been doing is uh, in one-on-one -on -one conversations with people to learn more about Eastern Pennsylvania in small groups. And I've talked to more than uh, 50 people uh, so far just to learn about Eastern Pennsylvania because, you know, it was 17 years ago that I became a bishop. And a lot has changed in 17 years. Let me show you the picture of me 17 years ago. You know... <laughs> I'm actually surprised how much Frank Sinatra looks like me. But uh, this is what happens after being a bishop for 17 years. This is what you get. You know, I preached a number of messages from this altar and other altars in Eastern Pennsylvania. But I'll never forget about four rows back on the left-hand side sat Peggy and Tom. Now, Peggy and Tom were active in the Westchester Church. They participated in its ministries and were, were engaged and involved in many of the th things in the life of Westchester Church. And I'll never forget that Tom, who was in finance, was also the treasurer for the Board of Trustees. And he was an outstanding treasurer and did amazing work for this congregation, for its health and its vitality and, and its finances. But one of the things we began to work on was that uh, we wanted to rotate leadership within the church uh, because we wanted to get more people involved. And you know how that is in some churches. People have the same position for, for many, many years. And uh, so we instituted that after a certain period of time, people would transition and somebody would new would move in. Well, Tom had been the, the treasurer for the Board of Trustees uh, since Adam and Eve. And, uh, you know, this was really a, a, a challenge. And I never forget uh, when that transition took place. I wasn't sure I was going to see Tom on Sunday because I knew he was upset. But one of the things I continued to preach about here was that everybody has a calling. Everybody is called by God, and God has a purpose for every life. And so I'll never forget one day when we had a covered dish supper. Do you remember when we had covered dish suppers in the church? Gosh, it seems like a lifetime ago. But uh, we had a covered dish supper. There, were, there, were, there was food left over. And somebody said, we should take it to the Salvation Army around the corner uh, to help people out. And uh, somebody said, you know, well, uh, is there anybody that can take it? And I said, you know, I have an early morning meeting. I can take it on the way to my meeting. I'll be glad to take that. I loaded the car up with the food. Uh, the next morning, I went over to the Salvation Army. It was before the Salvation Army was actually open. And so I banged on a side door to try and get somebody, because they had a homeless uh, ministry in the Salvation Army. So I banged on the door, and the door opened. And who stood there? Tom, Tom. I said, Tom, what are you doing here? He said, you told all of us we had a calling. All of us, we had a purpose. I didn't realize that my calling and purpose was this. Finance was my talent, but this is my calling. And he said, I come out, you know, every day and I help with the homeless ministry and the feeding ministry. And he, and I, and he wanted to bring me inside. He introduced me to everybody and everybody knew Tom. And then he took me into this uh, food uh, cupboard area. 
And it was well organized, as only Tom could do. And he organized it, and it was, everything was in place. And uh, Tom and Peggy are also a gift to all of us because they are the parents of Steve Morton. And just what a gift Steve has been to Eastern Pennsylvania. Today, my hope for laity in the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference is that every one of you hear the calling of God. Recognize that God has a purpose for your life. You might be asking me today, what, what do you mean a purpose? What do you mean a calling? Pastors are called. You know, preachers are called. Not, not us. No. God has a calling for every one of us. Sometimes it's into pastoral ministry. Other times it's working at the Salvation Army, or it's working on homes in the community to repair them, or working and leading in, in, in their Ida recovery. God's got a calling for every layperson in the Eastern Pennsylvania Conference, and it's my hope that all of our pastors will continue to preach about everybody's calling, and nurture people into ministry, even if it means helping them slide out of being chair or being the treasurer of the Board of Trustees. I have another hope, and this hope is for our clergy. But first I want to share with you a story. When I became a bishop, I was appointed or assigned to the Baltimore-Washington Conference a great conference. Uh, the Baltimore-Washington Conference helped to birth the Methodist Church that eventually became the United Methodist Church. There at Lovely Lane, when they gathered, and uh, one day they ordained Francis Asbury, and the next day they consecrated him a bishop. And uh, such a powerful uh, conference. And I followed uh, three bishops, all who were still living and lived in the Baltimore Washington Conference. First, there was Bishop James K. Matthews. Now, Bishop Matthews was a giant of a bishop. He um, was known around the world for his leadership and the work that he done, had done. And he was a tremendous bishop and had such great wisdom. And then uh, after Bishop Matthews was Bishop Yackel. And Bishop Yackel, he understood the discipline and he could articulate the polity of the church probably better than anybody else in the church at that time. He knew the discipline inside and out. And then there was Bishop May. And Bishop May was a great leader. He was a prophetic leader. He was an inspiring leader. He could get people excited and moving in a particular direction. And I would think to myself, how am I ever going to be like Bishop Matthews? How am I ever going to be but like Bishop Yackel? How am I ever going to be like Bishop May? So whenever I encountered something, I would say, oh, I wonder what Bishop Matthews would do in this instance. Or I wonder what Bishop Yackel would think about this. Or I wonder what Bishop May would do and how he would lead. And so every important decision, uh, things that were happening in, in, the, in the ministry, I would just keep asking myself those questions. What would Bishop Matthews do? What would Bishop Yackel do? What would Bishop May do? It was exhausting. It was exhausting. And finally, I said, God, can you help me here? And God said, John. See, God and I are on a first name basis. <laughs> John, I didn't call you to be Bishop Matthews. I didn't call you to be Bishop Yackel. I didn't call you to be Bishop May. I called you to be John Scholl, a son of God, to be who you are and who, God, who I created you to be. And so at that time and at that moment, I realized I had to be myself. And for all of our clergy, I want you to be yourself. Not what somebody else is trying to make you. 
not what you're trying to make yourself into, but the person God has called you to be, to lead in congregations and ministry all across Eastern Pennsylvania and around the world. God has called you and raised you up for the ministry, not somebody else, but you. And so I want you to be the person God has called you to be. Now, I also have a hope for the church. And of course, I have a story about that too. <laughs> when I was serving in the Frankfurt section of Philadelphia, uh, I often took the elevated train, which we called the L. Sometimes we said, let's get the L out of Frankfurt. Um, <laughs> but would take the train and often go into Center City for Metro Ministries meetings or other kinds of meetings in downtown Philadelphia. And I remember this one particular day, I was working on my sermon and I had a yellow legal pad and a pen and I thought I could work on the train. And so when I got on the train platform at Margaret Street, I kind of, as a train pulled in, looked to see toward the back of the train, which car looked like it had the least number of people in it, because I just wanted to get some work done. And so I saw the car, the doors opened, and I walked in and I scanned the train, and toward the back of the train sat a man with a 76ers cap on. And he had it pulled down over his eyes, and he was sleeping. I said, that's where I'm gonna sit. I'm gonna sit behind him. And so I sat in the, in the seat and I was working on my sermon and he woke up. Uh, there were some people who were arguing on the other side of the train in sign language. And it, it, it was loud. <laughs> and so he woke up and he lifted his cap up off his brow, and he said to me, those effing people stink. I said, excuse me? Now when somebody says that to you, you don't ask them to repeat it. <laughs> but sure enough, he repeated it. And he started talking to me, and all of these uh, words, that you know, I had not heard before in my life were coming and I was sitting there attentively trying to figure out how am I gonna do my sermon and he talked and talked. And then he finally said, what do you do for a living? <laughs> I said, well, I'm a pastor. Now, I thought I'd never get an honest word out of him again. And he said to me, only in the way he could. That's a blankety blank nice thing. <laughs> and he just continued to talk in the language he was familiar with. As we got closer to Center City, he began to tell me that he had just gotten off of work. He had worked two shifts. He was a forklift driver. His boss wanted him to go home, didn't want him to go home, but work a third shift. But he said, I need to go home and get some sleep. And the boss said, be back in eight hours. And he complained about his boss and the work that he was doing. And then he said, and my father's disappointed in me. My father's a head chemist at a chemical company. And he uh, thinks I should be doing more and I should be better. And uh, he talked to me about his father's disappointment in him. And we talked and talked. And I later on realized that if I, as a minister of the gospel, would have said, oh, don't use that language around me. Wait a second, that's not the way I talk. I would have never gotten to know him. I would have never had the opportunity to be invited into his story and his life and I will offer a word of grace. My hope is that our congregations will go into their communities 
and find the people with the 76ers hats. Find the people who drive forklifts. Find the people whose parents are disappointed in them. Find the people who are broken and healed. Find the people who are going through challenges and life is okay. Find the people that God presents to you. Our biggest challenge in the United Methodist Church is that the people in our pews do not know the people in their community. Our challenge in the United Methodist Church is that clergy and people in the pews do not speak the language of the community and continue to disconnect rather than to connect with people. My hope for every congregation is that you would get to know the people in your communities and offer them the grace of God, not on our terms, but on their terms. Not in our language, but the language that connects with them. Not in the ways we want them to conform, but the ways that God wants us to become Christ in the midst of them. Jesus got into the neighborhood. Jesus was with the Samaritan. Jesus was with the woman at the well. Jesus invited the children to come, even though everybody else thought that every one of these people were a problem. Jesus saw the child of God in them. So today, I invite each of us, laity, listen for your calling and pursue it with all vigor. Clergy, be the person God has called you to be and lead congregations into the community. And congregations, congregations, be open to the people God is sending your way. Amen.